Business of Architecture, episode 292. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. On this episode of the Business of Architecture podcast, we're pleased to hear from and have a conversation with architect Francisco Gonzalez Pulido. Francisco is the founder and leader of FGP Atelier based out of Chicago. It's an international firm. And previously, Francisco was partner with esteemed architect Helmut Jan. And so I think you'll really enjoy this conversation as Francisco pulls back the curtain about how he's grown his international design focus practice. Now, I do have to apologize ahead of time. There is a bit of background noise in this recording. Francisco had the, uh, was using a conference line. And so you're going to hear some background noise in the room. There was someone walking around with like high heels on the wooden floor or something. So at the very first part of the interview, you'll hear sort of a loud tapping noise. And I think it happens a little bit late in the interview as well. But nevertheless, the actual content is golden. And I hope that you get a lot of value out of it. And please forgive the poor audio quality. Francisco, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Great to be with you. We would love to get the story of the early days of your firm so we can then dive into how you've built what you've built today. You know, it's, it's amazing. You know, we're, we're kind of a, a, a very unique uh, firm, I think, in that sense. Our beginning was very unusual because I had been working, I've been in this profession for 25 years. And, and I was, you know, I was a partner to, uh, to a kind of a famous German architect here in the city. We've been partners for many years. And at some point uh, I decided to, uh, to leave, um, frankly spoken, to, to bring with me the work that I had uh, including my clients, obviously, and, and to sort of perform. But really the reason for doing this was really to expand our scope of projects. You know, uh, for a long time, I had been working on sort of the same typology. You know, you know, I mean, there were a lot of these office buildings, corporate buildings, residential buildings, a lot of work for developers. And I was really interested in expanding our portfolio to, to very different scales. And somehow these, these building types were not coming to me because they were thinking that all we do is big things in my former firm. So I decided to open up the atelier. And the reason why it's, an, it's called an atelier is also because I am convinced that our approach to design is very unique in the sense that we tailor things to context, to clients, to culture, the way you would tailor a suit or a dress for a person, you know, our understanding of the technical aspects of the building is really great. You know, I have to say, you know, I, I work for many years in buildings all over the world, especially in Germany, where technology was really there. Right. And, and we learn to do things in a way that we care um, about the last detail of the things that we design, you know, so, so, so the, the beginning of the firm was unusual because suddenly I was really sitting on my living room alone, you know, my wife next to me, which became my partner in this company, and with no, no, no architects around me and with a tremendous amount of work, you know, because I left, I decided to do this sort of in the heat of the moment, you know, and, and, and as I, I was really taking on this big responsibility of carrying on these big jobs, I was also planning on how to start this firm, right? And it was really crazy, you know, I couldn't really sit and focus on this in my table, it was just overwhelming. So I decided to take a motorcycle trip. So I left Chicago and I was driving south. My intention was to get to California to drive 4,000 miles and, and sort of use that time to think of how, how I wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, it was fantastic, you know, just to be in this very, I was alone in this very lonely roads, you know, driving and thinking about these things. It was very, um, very interesting to me because it was an introspective time, but at the same time, it was hectic because people were calling me, clients were actually, actually, I, I interrupted my trip because I had to go attend a business meeting, you know, of the only job that was new to the firm that was kind of important for the firm because obviously bringing all work, you know, people start thinking, yeah, this is what he did with his former partner. So I wanted to, to, to give this firm credibility with something new. So at some point I said, I have to stop my trip, go to meet, moderate, have that meeting 
and continue, which I couldn't continue. <laughs> you know, I had to actually start working on this thing right away. So it was really crazy that at some point um, we were very few working on, on projects that even big firms in Chicago are not doing, you know? I mean, it was, it was insane. I mean, I know firms that are 100, 120 people and they were not working on, on projects of the scale that we're actually working on in the first 16, six months of the, of, the, of the sort of formation of the firm. So it was a very stressful, but incredibly exciting time, you know? Um, obviously, you know, I had been running that company before. I was the president of the company. I was doing a lot of business development. So, but it's interesting. Once it's really your, your show and you're the only one doing this, you, you start thinking a little different about things. So you think that you know, but in reality, you really don't. You, you have some notions, right? You're using, you know, floating knowledge here and there to really structure your deal, but everything is really new. And that was incredibly exciting i i loved it i would do it again and again and again why is it that you as a new small firm were landing and working on these larger projects that other firms weren't working on to, to be honest with you, i think it had to do with my reputation you know i mean even though i i wasn't my name per se you know uh wasn't really out there um uh, too much in the media uh, my reputation with certain clients was really cemented. You know, people, uh, great companies knew about me. And, and, and they, when they learned that I was, and this is something that I was curious about. You know, I was always asking myself that question, how is it going to be when I, when I start this? You know, I, my, what is going to be the reaction of these people that they know me? Are they going to be loyal to me? Are they going to follow me? Or they're going to think, this is it. This is the end, Right. And no, it was really the beginning. It was actually interesting that some clients that were actually not ready to continue working with us in that former firm, they were actually so ready to work with me in, in this new gig because they like our, our, you know, my work ethic. They like the quality of the ideas. You know, they like, obviously, the deep knowledge that I have on, on building technology and in design, and that was sort of unquestionable. But what was, I think, inspiring for them, if I could say, was the fact that uh, there was no, not anymore this consensus with my former partner, you know? It was really a one-to-one -one relationship where we could actually uh, work together and, and, and not anymore, oh, let me talk to Helmut and I want my partner to be on board with these decisions. Not anymore. So it was really interesting. And, and of course, I had been doing airports and very tall buildings and very sophisticated buildings. And of course, this knowledge is with you, right? This is, this is my legacy already. This is what I carry wherever I go. It doesn't really matter that I'm one or 400 people, you know? I have that. I know how to do these buildings. I know how to do a large job and uh, uh, the largest job with, I know what I need in terms of resources and whatever. So that knowledge, it's amazing. You know, when you have worked with those clients and it's, it, it builds a lot of confidence in them, you know, more than your design skill, because there's a lot of good designers, of course, but the fact that you know how to really put a building together, you understand you know, the, the industries, construction industries, which was complex. You know, I work in the Middle East, in Europe, in China, in Thailand, in Korea, in Tokyo, in Latin America. You know, I worked everywhere. And, and I, I, I use a term that I call technical contextualism, you know, that I think it's, it's something that my clients also understand about my practice, that wherever I go, um, sure, I bring a certain design, um, uh, uh, notion, you know, that, that comes from my heritage, you know, from, from myself, but, but I'm very adaptable to work locally to, with the technologies that I have around me. I really get involved with contractors and this builds great confidence in clients, you know, because they know that you're not just a designer. You, 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 your, your cross section is very broad. So I think that's why um, it was not difficult for them to continue work with me and with new firms that were referred by them, uh, you know, to, to, to our work, they felt that it doesn't really matter if this guy has a new firm. It makes no difference. They saw it like a 
sort of a continuation of what I had been building. I always say, you know, that we were actually founded six years before we were founded. Because this, is my, this was my role in the former company. You know, with my former partner in the last six years of our partnership, I was bringing the business. I was designing the work. I was running the jobs. I was running the company, by the way, you know. So I was already acting. It was like, like the foundation of, of what eventually had to happen. You know, my wife told me something that I, I thought it was really bright. One day I was really struggling with this decision. And she said, calm down. You're, because, you know, I mean, there's moments that you question, you know, what you're doing. She's an architect, you know, and, and of course she's very smart, but she said, you know, to me, this was your next natural step. And you have no clue how much those words meant to me in that moment, because I, I clearly saw it. You know, I was just acting on that, acting on that. But when someone tells you, don't worry, this was the natural step. I see it, you know, from the outside. Just go for it. And then you see that everyone around you feels the same way. It was amazing, you know. And, and then suddenly, you know, after four, four weeks or, or six weeks after we were founded, we won a 1,200 feet tall tower in China, you know. And we were six people, literally six people sitting uh, in an office smaller than this room that I am here right now. It was fantastic. So, Francisco, tell me this. If you had to say a, a new architect comes into you and this architect has big plans, this architect would like to do landmark projects, would like to win bigger projects, what would you tell this architect about how to develop that business? Look, I think it's, it's, it's hard. You know, I mean, it, when, when I was – I'm an idealist in, in – in, in, I always use tables, you know, as, as uh, analogies when I talk, you know, because to, to my life, because, you know, I always see two sides, you know, this table has a joint here in the middle. And I always feel that sometimes I sit too much on the left, sometimes I sit on the right. And um, the, the idealist in me would say, um, work for a big firm, you know, find a job in a big firm, spend some time in a big firm, learn how they do things, right? Don't limit yourself to, to the frameworks. Bring really yourself to that place and push for what you believe in so you can get the best out of this, right? Because this was my path, really, you know. You know I came to the States not really like, oh, I'm going to set up a firm and now start building all these buildings. I said, no, I'm going to work for a guy that I respect, right? But I'm going to bring myself, really, all about me into the, 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 that place, not not limit myself to, to their structure and how they do things, but really to bring my own, you know, vision to this place. Um, I think this is actually quite important. I think working for a big place opens you, uh, you know, opens your, 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 your point of view quite a bit, you know, because it's not only about being a good designer, as I said. It's really about how you get all the tools that you need to do a big job. It's difficult. It's difficult to do these, these things. But I think on the other hand, um, competitions, for example, this is another thing that, that was very important. When I was 26 years old, I was still in Mexico. I entered very important competitions in my country where only the big names were actually big, uh, were taking part. Of. And I won a couple of those. And that gave me great confidence, if not credibility, but great confidence that I can do this. And this is so important in this business, you know. Uh, Credibility you gain over time. You know, and once you do a good job, you know, it's small, then the second one is gonna be double the size or double the budget, and this is how you progress, and this gives you confidence. But when you are actually competing again, names that you respect, and you put yourself on that stage, and you act with confidence, and, and then you win, obviously, that gave me, boy, you know, I left Mexico feeling like I can do this. I can really do this. Of course, Mexico was not the place for me to do this because even though I won these competitions, when they learned that I was a one-man show, they wouldn't give me the job. And that was disappointing. And this is actually the reason why I left. I said, I don't want to be in a culture, not in a country, because I love my country, but in a culture where they don't really appreciate, um, you know, that an emerging voice can actually change something which is very different right now. You got to think that 25 years ago when I started doing this, the mentality was different. I love design these days. You know, you see these very young guys that are growing extraordinary firms that are gaining credibility, 
because there is an appreciation of thinking different, not for the sake of thinking different, but because they have good reasons for what they do. But there's actually people listening to this because the people in control right now, they're younger, they younger in spirit and mind, right? There's all this new idea about what space and architecture does for people that frankly spoken wasn't there when I started. This was still the time of postmodernism and monumental buildings and, you know, these sort of buildings that stay there forever and becomes, every building becomes an icon. And I don't think this is the world that we live in right now. And so, so I think my recommendation would be be bold, uh, put yourself in, in the stage where everybody that you respect and admire is by doing competitions like that. And also work for a firm that is doing the large work so you get the tools to do what you want to do. So do the competition, work for a large firm, excellent. And it sounds like you went down this path. You had a book of business. You had relationships with clients when you started your firm. How does someone build those relationships? Let me ask you, how, Francisco, did you build those relationships in terms of fostering them? Because it's, it's not that we can just sit in our office and, yeah. and we're going to see our great work and they're going to give us a call. The, the uh, phone will never ring. That can't be the case. Right. The phone will never ring. You know that's 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 true, right? And but to be honest with you, uh, I I think that relationships is something. When you start a firm, you really have to go to every person that you know. You know, you have to let them know that you exist. We we make the mistake of thinking, oh. Uh, they know about me, you know, or, or you assume that just because you communicate with a couple of people, they know that you exist. This is not true. Uh, you know, some, somehow I think architectures, uh, our egos are so big that we think that we walk and a camera is all, all the time watching what we do. And this is a big mistake. We have to really think that quite the opposite, that nobody knows and everybody needs to know. And when I say really everybody, you know, I mean everybody, you know. Not, not to be, you know, smart and, oh, I'm going to approach these developers. They're not going to listen to you, you know. You need to get a job from your uncle, from your friend, from the neighbor who wants to renovate their garage. From, you need to get, because this is what starts really building credibility. When someone says, you know what, this guy, he just did a garage, and then you show, this guy shows, and it's an amazing garage, and you build it on time and on budget, that's bigger than some architects like the ones that you and I know that are doing big buildings and they're over budget all the time or, or always not on time. And so, so I think networking is very difficult. It's not about promoting yourself, you know, in a way that, oh, I'm going to write a letter and tell the world. Yeah, maybe that's, that's a component. It's really about telling people that you exist. Everyone, everyone. I, I am convinced, you know, to be frank with you, after 25 years of doing this and two years with a new practice, right now, you know, we have one of the largest jobs. There's not a firm in Chicago except one, I'm telling you. Except one, okay, that is going to be doing what we're going to start doing in one month from right now. We got the biggest job that an architect can get. We just get, got it, okay? And if you ask me, did you get that through your existing network? No. Is this because they knew who you are? No. Uh, was some, someone recommended you? Yes. And that recommendation came from someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew me. It's crazy, you know? So that's why I said, they need to know that you exist and what are you doing? Uh, it's amazing how someone put that, that portfolio in the table of a very important person. And when he saw it, he said, he's the man for the job. And, and, and they could have actually had a competition or work, talk to 20 architects or whatever. No, they went to me because I was, look, it's interesting. One day I was meeting a guy in the Middle East and told me, Francisco, we're doing 19 towers in, in Saudi Arabia. Why, why you're not doing one of them? And I said, well, I'm going to ask you why I'm not doing one of them. And I said, what do you do when you go and select an architect? And you know what he told me? He said, well, I turn around and I look at my shelf and I look at the books of the architects that I know that are on my shelf. I pick four or five. My clients come. I show them the books and they say, okay, have this guy work on this, have this guy work on that. This is how we're doing it. And I said, my goodness. So 
I have to do a book, right? So then right away, we put all this, we send this book to people that we know, and of course, we got attention. You have to use everything around you, but most important, bottom line, they need to know that you exist. I love that. And Francisco, you mentioned that. So the book is a great strategy. You have a monograph there of your work. You've been able to send that out to your network. What other strategies do you use to make sure that people know that you exist? Look, I think lecturing is important, very important in respectable places. Okay. Even if only five people show up, doesn't matter. You know, I, I've been in lectures where, especially in universities, you have no clue how effective that has been for me. Because when you go to universities, you, you, are, you inspire people, right? By what you do, your work, you know, who you are, your path, whatever. You know, there's many ways you can inspire people. And these guys in universities, maybe not the professors, because those guys are more or less your competition in a way, right? They also want to get a job or whatever. The students, they go back home and they talk to their parents. And their parents are doctors, developers, whatever, right? They're investing in the education of, of their kids. They are happy to see that the school is promoting this sort of exchange, you know, bringing you to give a lecture. So, so then from there, you wouldn't believe what leads to opportunities I have gotten. Very interesting. You know, lecturing, I think, is more effective than, than people think. Obviously, especially in academic environments, right? I mean places like the urban, urban Forum in New York, we were just talking about this with Walker, or, you know, uni architecture schools, or even other places not connected with architecture. You know, we just got a job for a culinary institute. And it's amazing that, you know, you go to a place that has nothing to do with architecture, you talk about your work, and now we're going to be designing the building where the school is going to be. So, so in a way, I think lecturing is quite effective. I'm not a big fan of, or I have not been, I wouldn't say fan. I don't think I understand social media well. Let me put it this way. You know, it wasn't really my generation. Not that I'm old, but, but, but I'm also not 25, right? So I don't, I use it in a different way. And I wish, you know, I would be a wizard of that because I think it has great potential. But I have to say that it's also, you see a lot of stuff that is very, maybe on, the, 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 the sort of the, the gap between what is real and what is not real, you know, sometimes it's, it's so obvious that you see architects that are promoting too much things that are so, you, so outlandish or, or unreal that it doesn't give you the, the most credibility, right? I see the effect that something that you have built has on people. That is very powerful. You know, when they realize that, actually, sometimes they ask me, is this a rendering? And when I say no, you can see how their faces transform. And even though it's small or big, it doesn't really matter. When they see that you have done it, why you did it and how you did it, that, so, so I think social media with, with real, things with with actions more than words it's a powerful tool as well right is there anything else besides uh, the book is a great idea you talked about lecturing social media what other ways or avenues have you seen that projects come to you or that you you form those initial relationships because we know that oftentimes the relationship that happens today two years from now five years from now eight years from now might turn into a project. So how does an architect get out and form those initial relationships? How do you approach that? You know, I, I did all kinds of crazy things, okay? You know, when, when I started going to China, for example, there was a moment that I felt in 2006 that the economy was really struggling in America. You know, I felt that things were not safe, that the environment was really chancy. I was getting very skeptical about future work in America. And I told my former partner, we have to go to Asia. And he was completely against this idea. He said, no, I don't want to work there, whatever. I mean, why going so far and, and an office? We're going to need an office. And I said, well, we might. But if we don't do this, it's going to be hard in two or three years from now. And I saw the, the emerging, the emergence of China as a 
as a real power, you know, in 2006. I was doing research, you know, I, I actually, this is interesting, I stayed in touch with my professors uh, in Harvard, in the business school, actually, I took classes in the Harvard Business School as well, and, and I was in touch with them, and there was this notion of China becoming a superpower in, in other fields, and that attracted me, you know, got my attention, so then I told him, I'm going to go there, and he said, and what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm just going to find... I'm going to find out who are the developers that are building something there. I'm going to send them a letter and I'm just going to go and meet with them. And this is what I did, you know, you know, without really knowing anyone. Okay. I, I, I went there with a, a friend. She was a Chinese. She was a executive assistant of an, a Chinese architect that I knew. And he was very generous. He said, you can take Shirley with you to travel China. So we traveled China for three months. And I was meeting all these people, you know, I was arranging meetings, going, showing them the portfolio. I met with more than a hundred developers. And you know what happened? I got one invitation to do a competition. Five architects, all of them really well known. And then next thing, I won the competition. And this is how I open an office in Shanghai. And then after that, you know, one building brings you two buildings, three buildings. For, and then one day we we're just doing the largest projects in China. But it was very hard. It was a road show, you know, and I took it this way. I was really pitching, 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 you know, and, and it was hard because it was not even in English. Not that this is my first language. You know, I'm, I still struggle sometimes with words, but I, somebody was translating for me, but I didn't care. You know, I was showing my passion for what I do, making sketches, you know, interested in their buildings. I was asking them, and what is this thing that you're doing and why? And interesting, I got one invitation. But then as years were, you know, it, it, later on, you know, I was getting phone calls from some of the people that I met that at that time they didn't have something for me, but eventually they did. And then I was getting invited two, three, four years later to do things. And I didn't win all of them, obviously. You know, you cannot be that kind of rock star, right? I think that would be great to win everything. No, but then you participate in these competitions. They see what you can do. They respect you for that. And, they, they, and this is how you start building a broader network, right? And it's amazing. I mean, I, I met probably my business development in China has been the most aggressive thing that I've ever done. And, and, and probably I know much, many more developers there than I know in the States. And, and of course, you have to understand a little bit the psycho psychology of the place. It's like right now, you know, I've been doing a road show in Mexico and because they saw my stadium. So now we're getting phone calls and now we're doing something in Puebla. Now they want me to go to Guadalajara and it's growing, growing, growing. But this is, this is the thing I gotta tell you. When someone tells me you can be one day in the office or you can be one day uh, or prospecting a job without doubt. Architects should be prospecting all the time. There's never enough work in the pipeline, never, okay? The, the, the world is, is so dynamic that one day you're here, one day you're here. When, so you have to have, you, you know, we have a, a board here right now I can show you with 12 prospects, you know, in addition to 25 that we have, because I know that out of 37, I'm going to get one. And, and you have to be very aggressive about this. Yeah. So I think road shows are important too. Yeah. And Francisco, how do you keep in contact with people? It's one thing to have a one-time meeting. It's another thing to be top of mind. So when they have a project, they remember who you are and they reach out. What's your strategy for being able to develop these relationships over time? Look, look Walker is here next to me, you know, and, and he, he's, he's the one, he's my voice on the ground, right? So I go and I make the connection, I come back, I talk to him. Sometimes, you know, when it's probably Latin America, it's easier for me because obviously the, the culture of communication is more informal, is more spontaneous, they like to use WhatsApp, you know, they stay in touch, they send you silly things to laugh, they invite you to trips, it's different. But for example, in America, Walker continues, you know, the conversation. Uh, he sends, uh, when we open a building, we let them know that we open a building. Uh, when, when we have a new publication, you know, we send a picture of, of if we have an opening, an event, if we're taking, if we're lecturing, we let them know, right? So we send these massive emails. 
Well, he does. I don't. <laughs> and then he follows up. Hey, guys, did you get the email? Francisco is in town. Or sometimes if I'm going, for example, last, last time that I went to New York, he said, talk to their organization again because they've been interested in our work. So we set up a meeting. And it was a 15-minute, you know. But it was enough. So they see you again. You talk. You don't go and, and, and try to sell yourself anymore. You go there. You spend 15 minutes. You talk about not the weather, but something a little better, right? And then, and then that connects you again, right? And so, so this is, you need ten, tentacles for this, right? You cannot be the only one. You need tentacles. When you're a one-man show, well, you have to do all that. But it's important that they know about your progress. I just wrote a letter to the president of one of the most important schools in Mexico because we have a job with them. And the email was really to let them know all these wonderful things that we're doing. We just opened this and we did that and we received this award. And so, oh my goodness, and this is a school that I went to. So then the guy, I would expect that he feels proud that I'm a graduate, right? He's building so many things that he would say, oh, he would be great for a job like this, right? So, so they need to know what's going on in your life. Uh, and, not, and not like, I don't mean to criticize people, you know, people have different styles of doing things, but it's not about what you wear or what you drive or what, the, no, no, it's not what you're doing, right? I mean, if you got an award, as small as it is, right? Or you get a small recognition or a mention, share it with the world. Don't be humble about it, you know, be, be open. They need to know that you're successful, that you're thinking different, that you have something to say. Francisco, do you think it's important to have a vision for the firm or do you think that these things happen organically? Look, I think it's a combination of both. You, you need to know where are you going. You never know what is the path, but you need to know where you're going. That's for sure. And I think having a vision, you know, when we founded FGP Atelier, the idea was we want a, a, a really wide cross-section of projects. We want to do small things. We want to do big things. We want to do airports. We want to do towers. But we also want to do... We're doing a very small community center in Chicago, you know. It's probably going to be one of the smallest projects that, that, we, that we've done, right? But it's so interesting, the mission of this organization. So when you have a vision, you align with people that think like you. And then you find these opportunities, too, you know. And the way you talk, you project these things. So people want to be part of your your. Uh, uh, firm as well because you share core values, you share a core ideology in some areas, right? A work ethic. I think it's important. But I also believe that as you, because you don't know the path, right? You know where you want to go, but you don't know how you're going to get there. It's like the motorcycle trip, right? I wanted to go to California and I said, I'm not going to bring a map. I'm just going to start driving south and then eventually I'm going to drive west and let's see how I get there, right? Map makes no sense to bring them up on a motorcycle. Just drive, right? But then as you're going through these things, then you find the moment where you said, I have to stay here and enjoy the view, right? Because this, this mountain will never be again in front of me because I didn't know that I was going to be here. So then your vision starts changing a little bit, right? But not your mission. Your mission is always to get to California, right? But your vision is different. You know, one day you're looking at a mountain and that makes you think a little bit different about your practice, right? Sometimes you're looking at a desert and then you might think completely different about deserts, right? You start thinking about sustainability in a completely different way. Or, so I think it's a combination of both. And where do you see the firm going in the future? What is your vision, Francisco, for the next 15, 10 years? Well, to be honest with you, I, I want us to do buildings that are almost not designed. And I think this is going to sound weird to you, but I, I love this idea of something that is so, I don't want to say machine-like, because I don't believe in machines. I think everything has to have emotion for humans to relate to it. But uh, I, I would love to see buildings that are really created um, more from the functional end because I believe that this is what's going to last and what is going to be relevant. I am convinced, you know, let me put it a different way. In 10 years, anything that is not essential is not going to be around. I'm convinced. We're surrounded by the superfluous. I want us to be acknowledged by a firm who really spend time thinking about the essential and that we build that. That's my vision for this place. 
Thank you, Francisco. So we're at the end of our time today. I want to thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. you know, it was great meeting you, Matt, and uh, look forward to uh, staying in touch with you. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to sign up for a free 90-minute online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to grow and scale without chaining you to your desk. Discover how to market your firm to win better projects. Sign up for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. That is a free online presentation. You can watch it from the comfort of your home or office anywhere that you are in the world.